Okay, so thank you very much, uh, the organizers, for this fantastic conference. Uh, this is a joint work with Darren Asemoglu and uh, Bill Kerr, who are both here. And today I will be talking about networks and the macroeconomy. So how are small shocks uh, amplified and propagated through the economy? Well, a recently growing literature has argued that uh, the role of uh, networks through the input-output linkages across firms and, and sectors could be one of those amplifying uh, propagation mechanisms. The idea is extremely simple. Uh, a shock to a single firm or to a single sector could have much larger effect on the aggregate economy if it reduces the output of not only the affected firm, but also the other firms or other sectors in the economy through the input-output linkages with the, with the affected, uh, affected firm or sector. So clearly, um, in order to understand the role, of, uh, uh, the role of networks for the macroeconomic outcomes, it's particularly important to understand the exact specific transmission mechanisms, and this will be the focus of our paper today. So in order to understand the exact transmission mechanisms, we are going to proceed in two steps in this paper. First, using an empirically plausible production function, theoretically we are going to show you that uh, when the preferences and production technology is called Douglas, then the transmission mechanism has very specific uh, uh, structure. In particular, supply, supply, shock, supply side shocks propagate downstream, meaning that it goes to customers, not the suppliers of the affected firm or sector, whereas the demand side shocks will propagate upstream meaning that it's going to affect the input supplying sectors or firms, but not the customers. So in the second part of the paper, we go to the data and we test these predictions using uh, sector level uh, data from the US economy. And in particular, we focus on four different shocks. In order to capture the demand side shocks, we focus on industry import shocks from China and changes in the federal spending. And in order to capture the supply side shocks, we are focusing on TFP shocks and knowledge and patenting by foreigners in the US. So without any further ado, in the, in, in the interest of time, let me jump directly into the model. So we are considering a perfectly competitive economy. It's going to be a static economy. Let me emphasize this. There won't be dynamics. It will be, stat it will be a static economy with N industries. And in each industry, the production function will, take, will, will occur according to this called Douglas production function. So the producer in each sector, J, is combining input from different sectors and combines it with the labor according to the scope douglas production function, and Z sub J is the sector-specific productivity of sector J. Here the notation is important. XJI denotes the quantity of goods produced by industry I, but used for production by industry J. So when we have two sub-indices, the first index will specify the producing sector. The second index will specif specify the supplying sector. And in every sector G, in every in every sector J, there will be a labor uh, there will be a goods market clearing condition, where the amount of goods produced on the left hand side will be equal to the consumption by the household for this sector, and then all the input demands coming from other sectors for goods J. In addition, there will be government spending, and we are going to assume that the government spending is purely wasted in this economy. Now, on the household side, the representative household has a Cobb Douglas utility function across different varieties, and they, they all have the same importance in the utility function. In addition, there will be this utility of labor, which is captured by this uh, functional form gamma L. And the government finances its expenses through lump sum taxation. Therefore, the budget constraint of the household takes very simple form, where the expenses on the left-hand side is simply equal to the labor income of the household minus the um, lump sum tax. Now, here is the main result of the model. So let me also be clear here that uh, we are considering any type of network structure here. We don't, restrict any, uh, we don't restrict our attention to any particular network. So that's why if I'm connected to a sector, then I might be subject to the shocks that the sector is, is being hit, and vice versa, depending on, the, on all sorts of network structure. Therefore, even though the model is a static model, there can be all sorts of propagation mechanisms because of this two-way interaction 
a potential interaction across, uh, across sectors or firms. So here's the first part of our main result. Consider a full set of uh, sector level uh, productivity shocks, which is denoted by this bold Z, a vector of shocks for each sector. The full impact of these shocks on sector J's output on the left hand side can be expressed as a sum of two components. The first component is the shock that's hitting directly the affected sector DZI, plus all the fluctuations of output in other sectors, the sum of all fluctuations in other sectors summed but weighted by their importance for the production of sector I. So since both on the left hand side and right hand side we have output, now we can collect all the terms, output terms on the left hand side and express the net change as a function purely of, of the shocks on the right hand side. Now when you look at the second line, now you can see the change in output in sector I as the sum of own effect, the first term, this own effect, plus the network effect, which is simply the vector of shocks affecting other sectors, but which are accumulated through an, an, an um, Leontief matrix. And in matrix form, it can be expressed in this form. The change in output in all the sectors will be a multiplication of the sector level shocks multiplied by the Leontief inverse. And this Leontief inverse matrix is this magical matrix which has all the information about the linkages across sectors. And this will be the important element here in terms of capturing all these propagation and, and, and amplifications. So there are two implications. Looking at this proposition, there are two major implications. Implication number one, when, there are supply, when the shocks are supply side, supply side shocks, in that case, there are no upstream effects and there are only downstream effects. The way to see it is looking at this coefficient here. This coefficient says that sector I will be affected by all other sectors shocks because sector I is using goods from sector J, all other sector J's. Not because sector I is providing goods to sector J, but because sector I is using goods from other uh, sectors. So therefore here, there are no effect on suppliers. The effect is only on customers. The second implication is that when we look at the own effect and the network effect, the, these are uh, the shocks filtered through the, the Leontief inverse, as you can see, multiplied by these AIJ terms. Then one unit of change in the own effect versus network effect will have the same impact on the left hand side variable, meaning that it's going to have the same impact on the output of the sector I. Now, if we look at demand side shocks, in particular, for instance, if we look at the government spending shock, in that case, again, we can decompose the total effect into two, two pieces. The first component is simply the government spending shock on the uh, affected sector, plus all the fluctuations in other sectors summed and weighted by their importance again uh, 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 from a sector, this time J's perspective. So here you can see that this time the supply side shocks will be affecting sector I because sector J's, other sectors, are using input from sector I, not the other way around. So that's why the indices are particularly important. So therefore, on, in the case of supply side shocks, the, the third implication of the model is that there are no downstream effects, only upstream effects. So let me be careful here and make a, a, a remark. So when we look at the, in the metrics form, when we look at the change in outputs on all the sectors, now we have this negative term here, somewhat mechanical, so to speak. When the government spending changes, since this has to be financed through the lump sum tax of the household, because of the response coming from the household side, there will be some reduction in output. So, but this is not because of the linkages of input-output metrics, but this is purely because of the household maximization problems. So therefore, this is not due to any uh, supplier or, or, or uh, customer relationship, and that's why we don't imply, when we say downstream and upstream effect, we don't mean this, we all mean this effect coming through these uh, coefficients here. So let me try to provide some additional intuition through the help of a graph. So in this graph, the, the 
economy consists of four different sectors, and the main focal se sector here of interest is sector number one. And sector number one is connected to two, three, and four, and each arrow points the uh, the, 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 the supplier, the, er the arrows are pointing from supplier to the customer, which means that sector, sector two is providing goods to sector one, and sector one is providing goods to sector three, not the other way around. But the relationship between sector one and four is both ways. Both sector one and four are buying goods from each other. Therefore, we can summarize this as two being upstream to sector one, three being downstream to sector one, but four being both upstream and, and downstream to sector one. Now let's consider a supply side uh, shock. And in this case, let's assume that there's a negative productivity shock hitting sector number one. In that case, the first impact, of course, is that since the productivity goes down, the marginal cost of production in sector one will go up, which means that the price of goods of sector one will go up. When the price of goods of sector one goes up, of course, the customers of sector one will be negatively affected by this since they are purchasing goods from sector one. Therefore, in this example, sector four and sector three will be negatively affected by this. So as you can see, the effect went downstream because mainly the customers have been affected by this uh, change in the uh, marginal cost of sector one. But now, in this example, both sector three and sector four is experiencing this negative effect in their marginal cost Therefore, their prices are also increasing. Both sector three and four's prices are also increasing. But on the flip side, sector one is also buying some goods from sector four. So as a result, when the marginal, when, when the cost of, uh, uh, when the marginal cost of sector four is going up, meaning that if, when the price of sector four is going up, now there's also a reverse effect. Now sector one is affected again negatively by this, uh, uh, which creates a second round effect. effect. But when sector one's marginal cost again goes up further, then we have again both three and four being affected negatively. As a result, we have this two-way interaction and, 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 and some of all these interactions. And the nice thing is that that's the beauty of the Leontief inverse matrix. All these interactions, two-way interactions, are summarized by the Leontief inverse matrix that I showed in the previous uh, slide. Now, the question is, why is there no upstream effect when there is this uh, supply side shock to sector one? Well, the reason is when sector one is being hit by this negative productivity shock, the, the, the price of uh, sector one's good goes up and the quantity goes down. And in this case, in this particular case, when the production function is Cobb Douglas, the price effect and the quantity effect on the right hand side are simply canceling each other out. So therefore the demand for uh, sector two, the upstream effect is, is unaffected by this change. So therefore, only the effect goes downstream, but not upstream when the shock is a supply side shock. Now let's turn to a demand side shock. And in this case, we are going to consider, for instance, a, a, a negative a government spending shock for sector one. When this happens, the first thing is, of course, the demand for sector one's good goes down. As a result, if I'm the producer in sector one, now I'm going to produce less, which means that I'm going to buy less inputs from my suppliers which means that all my suppliers are going to reduce, cut down their uh, production as well. So therefore, the effect here is going to be on sector two and sector four. Why? Because they are providing goods for me, because they are my suppliers. Uh, therefore, the effect goes upstream in that case. But now, when, they are, um, when, they are, when sector four and two are lowering their production, I'm also a supplier as sector one, I'm also a supplier for sector four, so as a result, this is going to have a second round effect on me because of this uh, linkages. So therefore, there will be a second impact on sector one due to this reduction in sector four's output, and this back and forth interaction, again, will create a, a, a rounds of, 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 of effects, which is again summarized by a, a Leontief inverse type of matrix in, 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 this, in the proposition. Now, in this case, the question is, why is there no downstream effect and only upstream effect in the case of demand side shocks? Well, in this case, what happens is that when there's a demand shock, the relative prices remain, chain, uh, remain uh, uh, unchanged. So there are no effects on relative prices. Since the prices are unaffected, therefore there won't be any effect on sector three. So these are the 
predictions of the theoretical model to, to test these uh, uh, s strong implications, we go to the data and, and, and we use the industry level NBRCS manufacturing uh, industry database, which spans the years between 1991 and 2009. In the first four years, we have 392 four-digit industries. Afterwards, we have 384 industries for a total of 6,560 observations. And the industry linkages come from Bureau of Economic Analysis uh, from 1992. We are using the 1992 input-output metrics. And we compute the Leontief inverse metrics the way the theory describes. So what we are going to do now is that we are going to take the raw shocks, the pure shocks from the different sectors, and we are going to filter them or accumulate them through this Leontief inverse metrics the way I described earlier in order to come up with the supply side shocks and demand side shocks. And now we are going to consider four different shocks. First, we are going to focus on import shocks from China, federal spending. These first two will capture the uh, uh, demand side shocks. And then we are going to focus on TFP shock and, and, and foreign patenting growth and these are going to capture the supply side, uh, side, supply side shocks. And we are going to run this regression in the empirical analysis. On the left hand side, we have the log change in industry level output. On the right hand side, we have the lagged uh, version of the dependent variable. Then we are going to include the on shock lagged by one period. We are going to consider the upstream shock, again lagged one by one period, and then downstream shock lagged by one period. And in all our specifications, we are going to include time dummies, and our regressions will be annual regressions. So here's the first result, first set of results. On the left-hand side, we have the change in log real value added, and we have the change in log employment. On the right-hand side, depending on which specification, we include both the one, one period lag up to three period lag dependent variable. So the first finding here is that the own effect, no surprise here, the own effect has a very strong impact on industry's output. But more importantly, in the case of this demand side shock, upstream effect has a very strong significant effect on the uh, industry's output. And as theory predicted, when we focus on the downstream effect, in that case, the effect is insignificant if anything, slightly negative, but again, it's, uh, it's uh, totally insignificant, very much in line with what the theory predicted. So another implication of the model was that the own effect and the network effect should have the same impact. So therefore, in this last row, we are testing the prediction that the two effects have to be the, the, the same. And at 5% confidence level, we cannot reject the hypothesis that uh, the two effects are the same. Then second, uh, second exercise is focusing on federal spending shock as another um, demand side shock. And when we focus on the results, again, the upstream effect, just like the theory predicted, has a very strong effect. And when we focus on the downstream effect, we don't get any uh, significance in this case. And then when we do the test, again, we, we find that uh, at 5% level, we cannot reject the hypothesis of having to, the two having the same effect. Now, in the third specification, we focus on the TFP shocks as a supply side shock. And this case, in this case, what we observe is that the downstream effect comes out very significant, whereas the upstream effect loses its significance in many of the specifications, and compared to downstream, it has much smaller effect. And when we, turn into, when we turn to the foreign patenting shocks, in that case, again, as theory predicted, we get very strong effect from the downstream side, but we don't get any effect from the upstream side. So next, what we do is that so far, we've included all these shocks in isolation in one specification, we, we, we put all of them together in one regression. In addition, we also introduce geographic networks. So the idea here is that sectors, uh, firms can interact through the local labor markets. As a result, one, one could expect that the shocks can uh, propagate through the uh, regional uh, collocation patterns. Therefore, we are, construct, we are constructing a, a collocation index, and we also introduce this geographic network effect on the left-hand side. And the first finding here is that when we introduce the geographic uh, networks, 
it has a very strong effect, again, on the left-hand side. And when we focus on the demand-side shocks, when we introduce all of them jointly, again, as theory predicted, they all come very significant, whereas the downstream effect doesn't come, don't, they don't come significant in the first two specifications, which stand for the demand-side shock. Then we focus on the supply-side shock. In that case, the downstream effect comes out very significant, whereas the upstream effect doesn't have any significance. Finally, so far in the regressions, the, the coefficients are a little bit uh, uh, hard to interpret in terms of their economic magnitudes, because we, so far in those regressions, we filtered the raw uh, shocks through the Leontief uh, uh, inverse matrix. In this ex exercise, what we are doing is that we take a pure shock to a single industry, and then we keep track of this uh, sector shock on the own industry, and through this input-output matrices on the whole economy. So therefore, this blue line in all specifications captures purely the own effect, whereas the red line here captures the impact of the single shock on all other sectors in the economy, and we just sum them uh, here. This is basically the, the total overall effect on the macroeconomy of a single shock to a single sector by one standard deviation shock. And as you can see, the network effect in all these specifications has at least as big impact of the own effect. And in the robustness checks, we, in, we, we, we try to uh, check the robustness of our results with respect to various specifications. In particular, we do our VAR analysis. We consider all shocks simultaneously, as I described. We exclude lag values. We use different weighting schemes. We introduce a sector fixed effect in all, in all those things. The theoretical prediction turns out to be very much in line with the, uh, with the data. So, in conclusion, there are three main takeaways from this study. The first one is that when we consider an empirically relevant production function, which is called Douglas, then supply side shocks have only downstream effect and no upstream. And the demand side sho shocks have only upstream effect but no downstream effect. And these empirical, when we turn to the data, the empirical patterns are broadly consistent with the theory, both qualitatively and quantitatively. And then finally, as I showed in these uh, impulse response graphs, the networks are at least as large as the, the own shocks uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the data. So thank you very much.